Hey, what's up you guys? Shardimus Prime here doing another movie review on Ant-Man and the Wasp. I just watched this movie on Friday night. I did not see it on Thursday. Uh, I watched the 4 p.m. showing on Friday and it was 3D XD Theater Room 11 at the Tan Fran Theater just so you know where I was and what I was doing on Friday afternoon. Kind of a weird time but it just worked out. That's when we were able to get somebody to watch the baby and the lovely Charlita One and I, we just went the two of us and uh, the theater wasn't very full, man. Uh, it was, but it was a 4 p.m. showing on Friday. Like most people were at work at that time, so you know, or on their way home from work. So understandable. Theater was about I don't know halfway full, something like that. But uh, I thought it looked great in 3D. As you guys know, I love the XD. I like the powerful sound and I like the visuals. And the 3D for this movie actually worked out really well. I thought anyway. So if you're gonna watch this movie, I do recommend checking it out in 3D. Now I'm gonna give a non-spoiler review as always and then jump into spoilers, which was the hardest part of me coming up with a list of five things I didn't like and five things I did like because there's a lot about this movie that I really liked and very little that I disliked. So just getting it out there, I really enjoyed the movie a lot. Um, I like that these Ant-Man movies are centered around family. I don't know, and especially with me now having a daughter, it really hits home a lot because you have the Hank and Hope relationship, and then you have the Scott and Cassie relationship too, so it's kind of, I don't know, so it, 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 it hits me in the soft spot, you know, I got a little girl now, things are a little bit different, and I don't know, I just really like that, and the whole thing with the, with the relationships with all the family members uh, I thought it was really strong, and it just makes it for really, uh, it gives it gives this movie a really strong foundation. I don't want to say franchise, because I, I feel like Marvel's just doing an excellent job of creating these separate worlds. It almost kind of gave me that feeling of watching Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, where it's like, this is a family of people that like that know each other, and I know they love each other and everything, and it's kind of like that with the Ant-Man movie, too. Uh, and I thought the acting throughout was just phenomenal. I loved all of the actors, even the little girl. I usually don't like watching kids in movies, but the little girl was really good too. They kept her, I, I felt like they kept her part in the movie, you know, pretty solid. They, she's there, but not too much, you know, they didn't do anything really crazy or anything with the kid, because uh, we know in the comics, spoiler alert, Cassie eventually becomes Stinger. Uh, first, she becomes um, Stature, right? So she becomes a superhero. And it's kind of neat to see, you know, how they're going with it in this version. Uh, but yeah, I love the acting throughout. I loved all the actors. I thought everybody was just necessary in the movie. Uh, and I like how the story just continues on very smoothly from the first Ant-Man movie. It just, it just felt natural. It didn't feel like a... See I feel like the days of sequels that are like, Hey, you liked part one? Remember this in part one? Well, it's even bigger right now in part two. Like... Like, Spider-Man 2, I love Spider-Man 2, but Spider-Man 2 kind of has that vibe a little bit. And uh, I feel like those days are over now with sequels kind of trying to kind of, I don't know, show up their previous film. You know, I felt like this is just not, not necessarily a very different movie. It's just like, it just felt natural the way it just continued off and just went forward. Uh, and then... Um, I love seeing this movie take place in San Francisco. Uh, there's a lot of different parts of San Francisco that we go to, and not all the typical tourist parts, too. Even, well, no, touristy parts, yes, but not the typical, like, Golden Gate Bridge stuff that I'm, I'm kind of used to seeing in every movie that takes place in San Francisco, you know? Like, so I felt like they, they went a little bit different as far as that goes, you know what I'm saying? And then, um... Just to give you guys a warning, uh, the first post credit scene, you know, stick around for that. Definitely, you know, don't walk out of the movie, stick stick around for the first post credit scene. But for the last post credit scene at the very, very end, uh, questionable whether you think it's worth sticking around for. Like, if you really got to pee and you think you might risk missing it, go pee. Go pee. It, it, you'll be fine, all right? Take a dump too, man. Shoot, like you, you may miss it. It'll be all right. <laughs> I think it was really one of the weakest ones, but there is like, you know, the more I talk to Shirley to one about it, there is something about that end credit scene that actually was a little fruitful for us to think about. So it gave a little bit of food for thought, but definitely not one of my favorite end credit scenes. On to the non-spoilers. Five, four, three, two, two. One! And I should use this hand and say, uh, I don't know what's up with my pinky finger now. Alright, anyway, spoilers! Here we go! 
All right, the five bad things I want to talk about, and I wasn't even able to get five bad things. I like the movie very much, so I only have four. Um, number one, uh, not as much Giant Man as I thought there was going to be in the movie. You know, I thought there was going to be more Giant Man. Uh, but when you really think about it, he can only stay as Giant Man for so long, so it makes sense. But for some reason, well, not for some reason, uh, the test footage that they showed us at San Diego Comic-Con, there's like some clips in there that they didn't actually use. So that's why I was under the impression there was going to be more Giant Man. And I sp remember specific things. If you guys are at San Diego Comic-Con, remember the part like where you see giant man looking over the building and then he goes hiding over on the other side like we didn't see that right i specifically remember seeing that so there's things in this that we didn't see and they showed for the majority of the test footage or, or the work in progress that they showed us at sdcc most of it was giant man stuff so they didn't i feel like it kind of led me to believe there's gonna more be more giant man than there was so eh, i'm not really upset about it but you know thought there'd be a little bit more but again we still got lots of giant man. I'm not upset, really, at all. Uh, number two, uh, the oh yeah, and Shirley one and Shirley one and I talked about this for a while. The Bill Foster and Ghost relationship. Um, I, I thought that was okay, but I thought it was Shirley one didn't really like the Ghost origin story. She thought it was really thin. I thought it was a little on the thin side too. You know what I mean? But I, I thought it was okay because. They didn't really spend a whole lot of time on it. They didn't really make it a big thing. So because they kind of went by rather quickly with her origin story, you got the message across. They didn't drag it out, so I don't really have a problem with it. But that was a little, I don't know, a little thin. The other thing is that Bill Foster, uh, I actually like how they handled Bill Foster because you don't really know if he's a villain or if he's actually a good guy. It ends up being a good guy, of course. But um I just didn't understand whether he really knew what Ghost was up to and if he was in support of her doing all these uh, bad things and working for the corporations and stuff. And the, oh, and the villain guy, the southern guy, I love that guy. He was great in Django. He was one of my favorite characters in Django. So to see that same actor playing another southern villain, that was very fun for me to see because I, I thought that actor was great. Uh, especially in Django. I think he killed it. Uh, but in this movie too. I, I, just a very fun actor. I really liked all of the actors like it's not that common for me to like really appreciate every single person even to Cassie's stepdad the cop you know I love how that guy kept on coming in for the group hug you know what I mean it's like putting his hand on the butt you know what I mean like hey hey hey, hey. you know uh, also uh, even the friend Scott Lang's friends you know the Russian guy and the black dude I can't remember their names but uh, those guys were great and Luis of course you know the one punch man Luis I love Luis, man. Uh, anyway, uh, tangent, bad things. Gotta think of bad things. Um, oh, yeah, this is probably one of my biggest disappointments is that we got no crazy stupid fine. Where was my Anna Where were we, my Anna Gona? No crazy stupid fine. So I didn't expect to see her in this movie at all, but I had to come up with complaints in no crazy stupid fine. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then the other complaint is the end credit scene. Uh, it's just an ant playing on the practice pads on, on the electronic kit and um, we saw that already in the trailers that's like in, I think even in TV spots and stuff like we'd seen that way early on the you know playing the drums which is kind of funny about that is that I teach in San Francisco and seeing that electronic kit and that setup like that I've seen pictures of a lot of my students uh, they'll, they'll show me a picture of their their electronic kit and like a lot of my students have that very same setup kind of going on so it's kind of funny to see an electronic drum set in one of those San Francisco Victorian houses because I've seen that in real life a whole bunch of times. So that's kind of funny. Um, also, uh, yeah. So that as far as um, so as far as that scene goes, what we were talking about is that Ant Man gets stuck in the quantum realm via post credit scene, uh, and then at the very very end we see the ant playing the drum. So maybe Scott Lang still has that mental connection to the ants. Isn't that what that means, right? So if he still has a con mental connection to the ants, then he's able to get retrieve himself from the quantum realm, and that's how he's going to get out. That's why I speculate anyway. All right, on to the good things. Uh, if I didn't say the good things already, uh, and I'm not going to mention every single part of the movie, all right, as always, but i got to say one of my all-time favorite scenes of the whole movie was the little boy Ant-Man. That whole thing with Scott Lang running around and he's all child size. That was so bizarre 
such a shitty size to get stuck at. <laughs> He's reaching for the backpack and stuff. And, oh man, it, it was that was hilarious. I thought that was great. Um, I also love how they write little Cassie Lang because like he gave her that little uh, <laughs> world's best grandma or something like that. That was hilarious. I, I think that was kind of funny. I hope I hope Emma's like a kind of funny kid like that. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's a weird thing when you have a kid, you start noticing little girls in the way where you're imagining your daughter being like those little girls. You know what I mean? And it's just kind of funny because I never noticed little girls or gave any little girls any attention. But it's like I'll see a little girl with like hair that's similar to my daughter's hair color, and it's like, is my daughter's hair gonna look like that? It's kind of weird. But anyway, uh, but yeah, I always tell parents that I have a kid and everything if if I'm you know, uh, talk about their kid or something, or, or if it's obvious that I'm looking at their kid, you know, you don't want shit to get weird. I'd trip out if someone was just staring at my kid for hell long. And then they, uh, anyway, okay, tangent. Um, shut, shut up, man. Shut up. Just keep going. All right. So Luis's uh, hair, the Jerry Curl thing, that had me cracking up. We had the hell long. That was hilarious. I was dying seeing that, especially because I have a friend that kind of looks like that. Isaiah, the guy who who wrote the hook to the Shardimus Prime theme song, kind of looked like that at one point. Yeah, so if you're ever wondering where the Shardimus, Shardimus, Shardimus Prime part came from, yeah, my friend Isaiah, he's the one who came up with that riff, and he looked just like Luis with the long hair. Uh, so that was hilarious to me. He looked like Ice Cat. Uh, and then, I'm thinking about it right now. It's just so fun. Yeah, uh, all right. So that's how, especially if you if you've seen like pictures of people from back in the day that had hair like that and stuff like people that uh, I just thought that was hell of funny. But uh, <laughs> that I don't know why, but yeah, it just it just hits home in a weird kind of way, man. Seeing that hair. That shit was hella funny. Um, but uh <laughs> shit. All right. So um also uh, there's that scene where Luis is talking about getting a suit, and he mentions, like, I, I don't even have powers. I, I just want to wear the suit. It reminded me of Raz. Like, could, you know, because uh, Raz was work working with Hank Pym, right? And then we have the Raz Giant Man. So it's like, what if they, like, kind of do, like, a Ned Leeds type of thing and switch things around? Maybe, like, uh, Luis becomes a Giant Man. That could happen, right? Maybe? Possibly? I don't know. But I believe Raz is a scientist, though. Anyway, um... So I like that, I don't know, kind of just got me thinking. Uh, and uh, I also got to say that I like the plot, the whole hot potato thing with the lab, you know, the cube lab. They used the lab to break a window open at one point, and I was like, ooh, are you going to smash the lab? But then if you think about, like, the whole concept behind the shrinking and the density and stuff, that it should be actually strong enough to do that. You should be able to do that. Um but, uh, yeah, so I liked the whole hot potato of everyone trying to steal the lab and going back and forth. I thought it was actually a really good idea to have that after the heist movie. You know, it's kind of still like a heisty kind of plot, but not the same exact plot as the other movie, so the first Ant-Man movie. So I thought that was really good. Uh, <clears throat> I have a note here that says I enjoyed every single character. I think I drove that point home. Um, uh, Charlita One brought up the Time Vortex. I remember in mentioning the Time Vortex, and she was like, ooh, that's how they're going to fix everything, the Time Vortex, because Hank tells Scott, hey, don't get lost in the Time Vortex, or else I'm never going to get you out of there. I, I can't help you. And don't you love how cranky and bitter Hank Pym is? I love Hank Pym. I've always loved Hank Pym, but this version of him, I, I feel like... You know, the, the, he, he takes everything to heart. He kind of reminds me of me a little bit where it's like he has good intentions and he has every he, ha, he has everything thought out and he wants to do the right thing. He has all the good intentions. He wants to do the right thing, but he still kind of comes off like a dick. That's kind of like how I feel about myself. Or, 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 or he takes things to heart, you know what I mean? I stress out over things a little bit more than I like to show on a YouTube channel and stuff, so maybe that's something I shouldn't really talk about because I try to keep that... But... You know, I stress over things, man. It happens. All right. <clears throat> um, so I actually think that that's not how they're going to fix everything with Infinity War is through the Time Vortex. I don't think that's the way they're going to go. It's possible. I personally think that that quick moment before the fight with Call of Obsidian and everything in New York, or I think it was with the Ebony Maw with Doctor Strange, like when they first walk out of the Sanctum Centurum and New York's all getting pummeled and everything... Uh, Strange does a time hex thing and he gets interrupted by Ebony Maw, I think. I think that's what they're going to use. I think that's where they're going to go with. Um, 
And then uh, the other thing that I really love, and it's the last thing I'm going to talk about, again, there's so many things to talk about with this movie, but uh, I loved that it took place in San Francisco, and I love just, I love that they're calling out street names and everything, because it's like, you start, you know, like, they're like, oh, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, where on Pacific are they? Oh, I think they're on Fremont. Oh, yeah, I, I, I walk past Fremont all the time. Like, they're, and seeing actual hills that I've driven up and down, I mean, of course, like, anybody who's visited San Francisco, you've gone down Lombard Street, that whole scene with Lombard Street, that was great. Uh, seeing, uh, I think it was on the van thing where they go up Russian Hill. I have a student that lives right around there. I teach lessons right around there. And actually, that part with the hill, and the, it starts to go over the horizon, and you can see the bay and Alcatraz right there. If you just go, like, two or three blocks to the right, that's where I work. If that does anything for you. So if you could imagine where I work. Because <laughs> it's, uh, I think that was, uh, uh, Knob Hill, right? Is that Russian Hill or Knob Hill? I don't know, San Francisco people correct me on that. But, uh, yeah, because I, I work in the Tender Knob. That's technically the Tender Knob. So I think that was Knob Hill right there. Or Russian Hill. I don't know. Because it's going over into the marina. So, anyway, uh, that's... So, oh, and then Fisherman's Wharf. I used to work at Fisherman's Wharf, too. That was seeing Fisherman's Wharf over there and, uh, and seeing that whole thing take place right there. That that was awesome. Yeah, so... Um, it, it, it's, it, it's really cool to be, uh, you know, I don't know, to, to like actually feel a part. That's what New Yorkers feel like, I guess. Yeah, because New Yorkers, like, there's tons of superhero movies that take place in New York, so they get to like, oh yeah, that's a spot. That, even though I've been to New York enough times to get a taste of that, like, in season one, Luke Cage, I was like, wait, I think I was on that street. And then, like, Abe texted me saying, like, hey, you recognize that part in Luke Cage? And I didn't know what he was talking about at the time, but later on we talked about it. And I was like, oh, I knew it. No, I knew it. That's like, it was way too familiar when I saw that. So anyway, that's my review. I want to know what you guys thought of the movie. I'm going to have a big time letdown stop motion compilation coming up later today. And then a sud unboxing video tomorrow. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to start getting reviews out tomorrow as well. I don't know. We'll see. Because San Diego Comic Con is coming up next week and I will definitely be there. So... Uh, or, yeah, in a week and a half. It's coming up very soon. So stay tuned, you guys. Thanks for watching the video. I hope you liked it, and uh, I will catch you guys later. Peace!